hello and welcome back to the channel so today we'll be talking about a very very important part of chemical engineering which is process safety engineering or technical safety engineering. I'm interested in learning more about process safety engineering and what it entails um, from a process perspective then please keep on watching so you'll be looking at the definition of process safety. We're looking at different types of analysis, both qualitative and quantitative analysis. We'll be looking at the role of human factors as well. And we'll be looking at previous accidents in history and then just the conclusion. So according to the Center for Chemical Process Safety, process safety is defined as a discipline framework for managing the integrity of operating systems and processes that handle hazardous substances and how we do that is by applying good design principles, good engineering practices and good operating practices. So um, we're looking at, when we talk about process safety, we're looking at the risks that are associated with processes that handle hazardous materials and energies and we are working towards reducing the frequency and the consequence of the potential incidents. Now these are highlighted the words hazardous frequency consequences and risk because these are things that we sort of we need to sort of understand better what they mean for us to be able to understand what process safety entails and then so we'll be looking at that later on in the video as well um we will then be what what, what these incidents include are toxic these incidents can be toxic flammable and um, we could have, so we could have things like toxic effects, um, fires or explosions. And the impact as well includes harm to people, harm to the environment, um, property damage, production losses, and um, damage to the business reputation. So these are, these things are important. That, and this, these, are the, these are the reasons why process safety is very important because we don't want people to be harmed. We don't want to harm the environment and we definitely as well don't want um, bad publicity or production losses as well this is so this is why process safety is very important so one thing that always gets um, mixed up is occupational health and safety with process safety so this is um, sourced from the iChemy blog that's the Institute of Chemical Engineers blog and um, it, we will just be looking through the differences between process safety and occupational safety. So the first thing is that um, process safety involves the unintentional release of chemicals, energies, or hazardous materials. While when we're talking about occupational safety, we're looking more on things like, you know, how to prevent trips, slips, and falls. And that's, so that's relating to classic health and safety. Um, so we also tend to see that we have, it's very easy, we have a higher frequency of um, occupational safety incidents. So it's, we have higher number of people reporting trips, slips and falls, maybe, you know, even in the office as well, it's possible that you are able to, you, you, you are faced with these things just because you have things all around, as opposed to um, process safety incidents that happen at a lower frequency. So you don't always hear of an explosion every day, or you don't always hear of, um, you know, um, a fire every day as well. Um, occupational safety tends to protect workers, that's people in the in the vicinity so even in the office it's all the occupational safety tends to involve people around the office well when we talk about process safety it could affect the workers and even the public alike so if we look into the recent um, issue in Lebanon as well so it wasn't just the people in where, you know where the explosives were stored it also you know had far reaching effects even far into other countries and um, the effects were felt in other countries as well um, the important another important aspect is that um, at process safety we tend to look at how does it affect the workers how does it affect the business how does it affect the environment as well whereas for occupational safety it usually we're lo usually looking at it at you know how does it affect human beings um, all around in that vicinity Another important part is that while we're looking at occupational safety, we're looking into changing an individual's behavior. So for example, if we're trying to um, prevent an individual from falling, uh, from you know experiencing a sleep or a trip or a fall, we're we are usually saying to people, you know, make sure the surfaces are clean and not wet. Make sure, you know, when you use a tool or you use a particular thing in the office, you know, you put them in the right place. 
whereas for process safety we're looking at changing the system design and um so we um we are usually looking into changing the system design and we're usually focusing on changing the system design in which behavior occurs rather than bringing in new equipment um, so process safety is usually more expensive to implement as well because when you look at things when you see um, when you identify a hazard for example you might then need to put in a fire protection system whereas for occupational safety it's more about changing behaviors and you know explaining to people this is the reason why we need to do that um, again process safety tends to have big consequences and major incidents whilst for occupational safety we tend to see that it's an at an individual level so it, the consequences are relatively smaller as well so we're looking more on you know cuts and broken bones which are quite serious as well but when we compare with say you know explosions pollutions fire um that's a bigger scale if that's on a bigger scale um but as well you know they're both safety they're both um aspects of safety and so they are both important they should both be discussed with different um at, diff at both team and board level and when we understand both when we have a better understanding of both of um, process and occupational safety it, we are able to bring about change in the plans or in the office so that's quite important as well so now we'll look into those things that were highlighted earlier in the video and just try to def define what they are so a hazard is a condition with the potential of causing an injury or damage so that could be for example us having um, toxic or inflammable chemical and uh, in the plants we could also have energy release from chemical reactions that are occurring at the plant we could have high temperature or high pressure streams um, or fluids on the plants as well and we could have a large inventory of these chemicals so these are potential these have a potential of causing an injury or a damage in the with the right with the enabling environment present so when we talk about frequencies the number of times we have an event occurring in a particular time or per unit time and then when we talk about consequence we're looking at what's the measure of these expected effects or undesirable results of an incident and then when we bring those together at both frequency and consequence we then come um, we then end up with risk and that's a measure of say human injury environmental damage or economic loss in terms of both the incident likelihood and the magnitude of the loss so like we mentioned before you know process safety is at human level environmental level and business level as well so we could be we need to look at the risk at those um, in those different sectors as well so now we'll just look into how we do analysis both from a qualitative and quantitative point of view so for the HAZOP um, that's a hazard and oper operability study that's what it stands for and it's a systematic qualitative technique that we use to identify process hazards and potential operating problems using a series of guide words to study process deviations so what we do usually is to divide the process and this could be the um, um, piping and instrumentation diagram we're dividing that into manageable sections and what we do is in those sections or nodes as we call them we determine how the process works and then we look at what deviations from the intention of the design can occur what are the causes what could cause that and what could the consequence be using suitable guide words so this is an example that I've got um, from the instrumentation and control .net website. Here we can see some information. So the information includes the description of the node, the design intent. So what is that node supposed to, what is it designed to do? And we have space for comments which, if required and then deviation as well. So in this case, we are looking at if there is low or no flow in this node. We've got an equipment ID as well. We've got a drawing number and we've got the design conditions and parameters in terms of the um, pressure and temperature. So what we do is to then identify the cause and then what then happens um, as a result of no flow, which is the consequence. We can also categorize these um, hazards as well and then if we've got any comments that can also go in there 
And then if we look here, we, has, we can see the consequence, the probability, and the risk ranking. Um, so this is basically how this risk is calculated. So we'll have a look at a risk ranking matrix on the next slide um, that shows how this is calculated. But this is this gives us the risk ranking and the color. The coloring gives us an idea of how highly ranked or low low ranked the the um the hazard is. Then we've got a column as well where we can identify any additional controls because what we've done previously is to identify the intrinsic controls that's the the existing controls that we've got, and then um we also put a responsibility um column for what needs to be done what, what additional controls need to be put across and that's what that's how we um derive action list and so we also see a residual risk um column here with the consequence and probability and the risk ranking and this is quite important because what we can see is that after the um application of the additional controls we can see that the probability of this risk occurring is has gone down from three down to one and the risk ranking has gone from b to a which is the um so this is the goal of the hazard um, of the hazard so identify which hazards and to make sure that we also identify mitigation measures to bring them as low as possible to bring the the risk of the hazard as low as possible so here we look at the risk ranking matrix. And so this is quite, because it's a qualitative analysis as well, we have different bands. So we don't necessarily have to know exactly what the consequence is in um, numerical values, but we can identify what band it is. So we are, what we are saying is if we get a risk, um, sorry, if we get a hazard actually occurring, what's the consequence of, of that? Is there going to be minor injuries or is there going to be a fatality? So if we're able to, you know, what we, we aim to do during hazards is to identify which band that occurs, the hazard occurs, what we aim to do in hazard, hazard in, oh, what we aim to do in hazards is to identify the, the consequence um, band and then um, place the hazard accordingly in the, in that band. In addition, we'll look at the likelihood, which is what we can see on the horizontal. And again, that's trying to, you know, just place it in a range um, as opposed to getting an exact value. And so when we get that, so for example, if we've got a hazard that's not likely to occur in normal circumstances, but when it does occur, it's it leads to injuries or illness that requires hospital admission, then that has a medium risk. And so what we'll be trying to do is to reduce this possibly um, to a low risk or, you know, or low, lowest risk. So we'll be trying to move it this way. So the aim is to move um, all the risk as much as possible to, you know, the, the low risk, um, the green zone. So in the quantitative risk assessment, what we do is quite similar as well. We define the potential event sequences and the incidents. And then, and this is usually based on qualitative hazard analysis um, or initial analysis that we do. And then we evaluate the consequences. We evaluate the impact on people, environment, and property. And then after that we estimate the potential frequency and we do that using generic databases and event trees and after that we estimate the risk once again by combining the potential risk the potential consequence for each event with the event frequency and summing that over all events so this is an example of a risk contour we would get using a modeling tool and so here we can see a release location that this is the area within which for example you will feel the four kilowatt um, radiation um, based on a release um, from this location and so this shows this this shows the risk control for a single release location and you can see that this is superimposed on a plot plan and we can see here in the plot plan this is this I got from the um, off the internet as well um, this shows the skill um, that has been used for the plot plan.
So here we can see well, the, the effect or the area in which the effect of a, of a flammable um, radiation can be felt. So this is then what happens. This is another example of a risk contour, but this shows what happens when you know the risk is summed over all events that could occur from different um, release locations. And so this again is superimposed on a plot plan. Um, this is an example that I got off the internet as well. So this is an alert triangle and what we do is show where our risk um, lies. So as we've so when we then when we're able to <clears throat> so when we sum up all our risk over all events, we get a single figure and we're able to then real, um, pinpoint where that where the risk lies, whether it lies in the intolerable region or the tolerable if a lab region or the broadly acceptable region. So when we are in the intoler intolerable region, we definitely need to apply risk reduction measures to move it into the tol tolerable if a lab region or the broadly accepted region. If we are in the tolerable if a lab region, then it means that we can um, we can employ relative relevant good practice plus risk reduction measures um, as long as they are grossly disproportionate. Um, and then if we're here, then we're good. Yeah, we can also see that we have different risk levels for workers and the public. So I'm talking about risk control measures. The hierarchy of controls is to try to eliminate the hazard. If we can, that's to remove it. We can then try, next we try to substitute the hazard with the less hazardous item. If we can't, we try to isolate it, which is to use physical barriers to keep the hazard away from people or sensitive areas. So an example of this is um, applying a bond around a place where we know that we can leak, say, um, flammable material that can turn into a pool fire, for example. And then next we look into engineering controls that's using alarms or warning systems to alert the operators to know what to do next. If we can't do that, or in addition, we can put in uh, um, administrative controls, which are procedures or training of um, the operating staff as well. And then we provide um, personal protective equipment um, and other equipment to ensure that if there is an explosion or a fire, there is, you know, there, there is um, personal protective equipment to guard against that. But that's always the last resort. The next thing we need to um, consider is human factors. And this is important because we are considering, it, we need to consider the interaction of the human component with the actual system. And one of the things, and these are, this can be um, divided into three things. So ergonomics, and that's, in this what that entails is matching the design of the equipment and the procedures to the physical capabilities of the human operator. The next thing is the cognitive human factors, and that in that case we are matching the design to the abilities and the characteristics of the human operator. And then safety culture as well is quite important because this is basic. This is more on a organizational level, um, just trying to understand. And make sure that the, the the organization has a good culture and good act attitude that influences the way operations are carried out and this includes things like how how often do we check our safety practices um, what happens what's the procedure if someone identifies something that is unsafe is there you know is the person is the person which hunted or you know is the person sort of allowed are people allowed to express themselves freely when it comes to safety as well so these are things that need to be um, considered so if we look at previous accidents we have accidents such as the texas city refinery explosion that occurred in 2005 we also have and and here we can see that some of the safety issues were you know having to do with startup poor maintenance improper siting of trailers and um the presence of an ignition source. Another accident was in 1974, which was the Flixboro chemical plant explosion. And that was um, a cyclohexane plant. And it was quite serious because the fires were still seen burning on site 10 days later. 
and this was quite um an important part of history because in addition to this and um, to the Flixborough accident as well as the Seveso disaster in 1976 the main thing that came out of those is the fact that um, there was a limitation of inventory that was encouraged and also the setting up of the advisory committee on major accident uh, or major hazards at the end of 1974 so in conclusion um, Dr. Trevor Clairs, who is a um, father of chemical process safety, says that there's an old saying that if you think safety is expensive, try an accident. Accidents cost a lot of money. And he's just talking about what we've discussed before in terms of um, damage to plants, injuries as well, and also the company reputation. So it's very important. This just gives us an, an understanding of why process safety is important. So I hope you've learned a thing or two about process safety. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and share with your colleagues as well that might find it useful. Um, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.